Father, thank you so much for all there is to learn in your word. It's uh, so much information. Sometimes it's too much information. Lord, help us to have pliable minds to learn new things. And I've, I've learned so many new things just in the last 10 years, in the last five years, and had to kind of uh, wad things up and throw them in the trash and go back to the drawing board. And God, you just, uh, the things that are in your word, if, if the more we learn of the rest of your scripture, the more things fall together. So help us to be faithful in your word, all the books, God. And we pray that with your Holy Spirit, you teach us, you grant us wisdom and understanding. All for the glory of Christ. For it's in your name we pray and give you thanks. Amen. Amen. All right, so Revelation uh, 11 last week, we hit the two witnesses and a little bit about the temple. And we also revisited again, took a look at, at the woes. And um, just as some, some notes, and you remember I, I had these handouts Last time, did everybody get no, one of these handout yeah. things? Okay. Here, I want to keep one. Yeah. That's why I like yeah. That. <laughs> well, so here's the thing with the woes is that depending on who you talk to, you might have the woes slightly interpreted as far as how they land with somebody a little bit differently. And looking looking over it about three or four more times this last week, um, you remember. The first woe is in chapter nine, and with the first woe is first of all we got a, we got a satanic component, a demonic component, an evil component with all three woes. So these are clearly by permission then, because before something satanic and demonic even can happen, they have to have God's permission, right? So that's what we saw is, is the woes in chapter nine, and <clears throat> excuse me. You see in verse 12, I believe it is, where it says that it's the first woe. And it looks like it's pretty clear the first woe was pretty much all chapter 9 with the locust-like beasties and the horse-like horde. Um, several hundred million that come traipsing out onto the earth and uh, spreading out on, on the planet. Um, pretty horrific kind of a thing. We see that people are tormented with the locust beasties for five months. We don't really see an expiration or a uh, anything like that for the horse-like horde creatures coming out. It just tells us on there that they're released on the earth and we don't really see where they expire. I don't know if they're still out there all the way through the end of the Great Tribulation or what, but um, anyway, so that chapter 9, that's the first woe. The second woe, we're told in, in um, chapter 11, and we know it's still a parenthetic, but even though it's a parenthetic and it's strictly speaking not in chronological order, it's parenthetical, it's setting up all these events that happen within, you know, a couple days here in um, the middle of the tribulation week. And the reason why we know that is because the witnesses are, we're told that they are going to be ministering for how long? Three and a half years. In fact, it's even given to us in the matter of days, right? 1260 days. So that takes us right to the middle. And then we're also told um, in the middle of the tribulation that that's how long, too, when um, we have the middle of the week and the abomination that makes desolate. So the timing of how these things, events happen can be maybe be a little bit tricky and be open for interpretation, but um, so anyway, in, in uh, the second woe, we've we've got the beast from the pit in chapter eleven, verse seven, and and uh, so he comes. It's, it looks like it's Satan getting kicked out of heaven down to the earth, and he possesses Antichrist. So that would be the second woe, really, is that, you know, woe, Antichrist is now possessed by Satan himself. Now, where it gets kind of weird and tricky, though, is the third woe. But, you know, as far as exactly how you want to interpret what it is, 
that's in chapter 12, verse 9, and we're going to look at that tonight. But we know it says the third woe is of Satan being cast down to the earth with a third of his angels, the fallen ones with him. But it's also the abomination of desolation. So, um, in, and that goes all the way up to, let's see, chapter 12. Remember the chapter breaks aren't particularly inspired, although sometimes they they uh, make, make some well-educated guesses as far as where they should divide the chapters up. But really, chapter 12 all the way through 1310 is kind of one segment, and it's all about that event, the abomination of desolation. So that is um, Satan and the false prophet, particularly in the temple, and the number of the beasts and all that stuff that happens. So... Um, that is the satanic trinity. I guess you can see them all at play there. And if you see a different way of interpreting that, a better way of interpreting that, I'm, I'm trying to offer some clarity there on how that goes. And um, so any more input you have on that and what you'd like to share would be would be awesome because we can, we can kind of, uh, as the saying goes, spitball on that back and forth and maybe come up with some different ways of looking at it. But... It's kind of a, it's kind of a mess, um, how all this stuff is being set up. We have chapter eleven, and we see some of the players in chapter eleven. Chapter eleven is the in Jerusalem, the temple, and the two witnesses, right? And then chapter twelve. Now, what we're going to be seeing is we're going to be seeing um, the Antichrist and and Satan being kicked from heaven. So the stage is still being set some more. And so this is still some more parenthetical. And maybe the best way to do it is, uh, as we launch in, is just to real quick read through once the whole chapter just to kind of get, get it settled in. We're not going to try to figure anything out first read through, but let's just, for context and flow, read the entire first, or the entire 12th chapter. And then um, we'll kind of go through bit by bit. Does that sound good? Mm -hmm. All right. Now, a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of 12 stars. Then, being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon having seven heads and ten horns, and seven diadems, that is crowns, on his heads. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour, devour her child as soon as it was born. She bore a male child. I wonder how she knew it was male. Do you think she was a doctor? <laughs> so a little Most modern, modern culture and news coming into this here. Must have been the biology. She was a biologist. Is it? So she bore a male child who was to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and his throne. Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there 1,260 days. Which is how long? Yeah. Yeah, here's, <laughs> the steam is really, keeps coming back, right? Verse 7, and war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. But they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation strengthened the kingdom of our God. And the power of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren, who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives to the death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, because he knows that his time, he has a short time. Uh, when Now when the dragon saw that he had been cast to earth, 
He persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child, but the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for time and times and half a time. Three and a half years, very good. <laughs> From the presence of the serpent. So the serpent spewed water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. But the earth helped the woman and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. And the dragon was enraged with the woman and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Clear as mud, right? Yeah. All right. So that's why we call this chapter here, um, chapter 12 is deliverance because I'm, I'm choosing not to focus on the negative and the dark with what we have here with um, Satan. And we're going to look at the deliverance because the deliverance is what God has designed, uh, setting up for, well, set up for us the uh, the chronology of the Antichrist, um, and lays the groundwork of who this player is. And we're kind of looking at it like a stage. You have the stage, you furnish the stage. Now you've got the different players, and you got to give some background information. So you can do like the old melodramas of the past and you can boo and hiss if you want every time. <laughs> like the old, what was it called? The Birdcage Theater. Remember that from the old, old Disneyland thing in Los Angeles? I don't even know if they ever had that in Florida, but they had one of those old melodrama stages that was kind of fun. Not very fun. What's that now? Not very fun. Not very fun, was it? They had, I don't know, Birdcage I think was a Disneyland. I might be confusing because they're both kind of close together and it's been many, many moons since I've been there. So it could be, it could be knots. But, so we've got here um, the great sign that appeared in heaven. And there's a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of 12 stars. First of all, I want to say that there was a, a lot of excitement uh, beginning close to a decade ago when using NASA software, you could look and you could find where there was this alignment that really did match this up. You go way back in the past and you had to go back to like maybe the time of Christ where there was a similar type of alignment. And with nine of the stars, Nine of the planets were lined up a certain way and um, some other stars and so forth. And, and you had the, uh, what was it? it was the line of Judah and three stars is what it was. So it came out to like a crown of, of 12 over her head and the moon at her feet and really exciting. And you, if you flash forward and you run the NASA software further into the future, you got hundreds and hundreds of years before anything close to that ever happens again. So people were watching and they didn't know what it meant, but a lot of people were hoping tribulation and it happened on a Feast of Trumpets in 2017. So it happened and the day went through and uh, no man knows the day or the hour but this, but you know, you know the season and so forth and it's the feast that no man knows. So it's a two-day celebration. So for over a couple of days, people were really tense wondering, is anything going to happen here? What? Because it's God said it, it's a sign in the heavens. So what does this mean? Well, nothing dramatic happened. Does that mean that nothing happened at all? We simply don't know. I will say this, that the passage as we get in here and start reading, the passage isn't so much about a promise of the rapture or anything like that, that it's going to happen. This is, uh, is particularly in this first part here, it's kind of lining up what's happening with the Antichrist. Now, it goes into this whole thing about war in heaven. It could be that that's when the war in heaven was kicked off. You know, we don't know. But here's the thing is that it doesn't really do us much good in the sense of fixing a date or anything like that because we're told we won't ever be able to do that anyway. But because we don't know how long the war is, right? There's a war in heaven that's going to happen. And some people will argue, well, that war has always been going on, but really, no, it's not. This is a particular one. This is the final battle. 
in the third heavens. As we are getting ready to look and see, we know Satan has had access to the throne accused of the saints for, uh, since the beginning anyway, right? The, um, probably the oldest narrative in the Bible is the book of Job, and this is what we see. We see Satan before the throne of God, and he's accusing, um, he's accusing Job before God. And um, so Satan is, um, since the fall, he's been granted dominion to a point on this earth. He's the prince of the power of, this, of the air. He's the god of this age, this world system. So this is where we're at with, with Satan. So, but this particular one, as we just read through, Something happens to where he's finally booted out once and for all. He's kicked down to earth, and he knows his time's short, and he's very angry. So he begins his scorched earth policy. So let's take a look at this, though. In the real world, what this is about um, down here, there might have been a sign in the, heaven, in the heavens, but uh, the other thing that this is definitely telling us about is uh, another story that we read in the scriptures that should be very familiar to uh, to all of us. And um, do we remember a story in the scriptures at all of um, 12 stars and the sun and moon from all the way back in Genesis? Yeah, uh, your brother Joel's uh, dream. Oh. Dream 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 dream. Joseph's dream. Joseph. Joseph. All your right. brothers are by. Yeah. Yeah. And just been in a dream with the stars. <laughs> I saw the wheat and I was like, that's the wrong dream. So all the one, one dream, yeah, and the skinny cows and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, some people will maintain that the woman clothed with the sun, in fact, most people will. The woman in this story here is the church. Well, if the woman is the church, we've got a problem because she's the bride of Christ, and why is she here giving birth? She's always depicted in the scriptures as a virgin. So, so that's awkward, Okay. Um, and, and if you want to verify that, you can scribble down um, 2 Corinthians. Well, it says, it just says, 2 Corinthians 11, 2. For I am jealous for you, Paul says, with godly jealousy, for I have betrothed you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. So if we're a chaste virgin to Christ, we should not be, as the bride of Christ, pregnant. So, the church, and the church does not give birth to Christ, does it? He's the, you know, that, yeah, so that doesn't, that's a, a Roman Catholic thing in particular, but a lot of people still kind of carry that today, and they'll try all kinds of gymnastics to try to make things work and twerk things to make it look like church. No, but go ahead and flip to um, Genesis, Genesis 37 here real quick. We may as well take a look at it. Genesis 37. Oh, me too. <laughs> that you guys just read this? Me too. Cheater. <laughs> oh. Cheater. <laughs> All right. Oh, you flipped right to it. I did too. It took about five tries, but I flipped right to it. Okay, so now Jason. J Jason. Jacob is the other guy. Jacob dwelt in the land where his father was a stranger in the land of Canaan. This is the history of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brothers. And the lad was with the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah and his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to his father. He was a tattletale. Now, Israel loved Joseph more than all of his children because he was the son of his old age. Also, he made him a tunic of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. Now, Joseph had a dream, and he told it to his brothers, and they hated him even more. So he said to them, Please, hear this dream which I have dreamed. Well, there we were, binding sheaves in the field. Then behold, my sheaf arose, 
and also stood upright. And indeed, your sheaves stood all around and bowed down to my sheaf. And his brother said to him, Shall you indeed reign over us? Or shall you indeed have dominion over us? So they, they understood immediately what I was saying, what the meaning of the dream was, right? And so they understood it as being Israel, or the sons of Jacob, right? They weren't foreseeing some vision of church. So they hated him even more, more for his dreams and for his words. Verse 9, then he dreamed still another dream and told it to his brothers and said, Look, I have dreamed another dream. And this time the sun, the moon, and the eleven stars bowed down to me. So he told it to his fathers and his brothers. And his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you've dreamed? Shall your mother and I and your brothers indeed come to bow down to you to the earth before you? So they understood. Joseph understood that not Joseph, Jacob understood that he's the sun and his mother's the moon, right? And then they uh, then his brothers. And his brothers envied him, but his father kept the matter in mind. And ultimately we know what, what happened historically and Joseph was his because of the, his brother's hatred for him, he ended up being um, beat up and thrown in a hole and pulled out of a hole and sold into slavery and spent some time in, in prison and quite a history. And then through his interpretation of dreams, he ended up being the number two man in all Egypt serving Pharaoh, right? And then when there was famine in the land, what had happened, his entire family came out to bow down to him for food. So this is, clearly this is uh, pointing back at that story here in Revelation chapter 12. And anytime we want to understand scripture and some enigmatic passages such as we have here in Revelation chapter 12, is most of the time, we have but to do some due diligence and search out scripture and find that scripture will interpret the scripture. And that's, that's the case here. If you want some more verses that show Israel described as a woman in travail in the Old Testament, I have maybe a half a dozen here for you. You can scribble them down in your margin notes or on, your, on a page there and you can search them out later. But they are um, Isaiah 54, 5, and also Isaiah 66, 7. Then we have one in Jeremiah, Jeremiah 3, 6, Micah 4, 10, and Micah 5, 2, and 3. There might be more out there. And if you find some more out there, you're welcome to fire them off to me so that I have them as well. This whole chapter is seen, uh, this segment is seen as a, a parenthetic sweep of history. Let's, let's take a look at this more. So she was pregnant and was crying out in birth, in birth pains, in the agony of giving birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, and on his heads were seven diadems. Let's stop right there now. We're going to get into the number of heads and the crowns and all of that probably next week because it comes together next week. But just an uh, immediate look here, the great red dragon, we already know the dragon is the serpent known as the devil and Satan and all of that, right? So the woman giving birth and Satan's right there ready to destroy the child, the male child, right? And we know how that worked out in history, don't we? This gives us the story of, of uh, Satan being contrary to God's plan from the beginning. I mean, really, he even tried that with Moses before, who was a prefiguring of, of uh, the Messiah, right? Everybody to and under, you know, kill them all. So we, we know that that's what was going on, and that's what it's telling us here. And then we also have um, his tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. What is that story about? Satan and his, his demons, yeah, his principalities and powers of darkness, demons and all of that. Um, we, we will, I want to look at a couple of passages, but this is about the fall of Satan, where his 
origination <laughs> his origination story so the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth so that when she bore her child he might devour it she gave birth to a male child one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron who is this that's supposed to rule with a rod of iron Jesus. Jesus. We have that also in Psalm 2 9. But in, um, we just read it not long ago in Revelation, well, it was a long time ago, wasn't it? Revelation 2 27, about him ruling with a rod of iron. We have it here. We also will see that again in, in um, Revelation 19 and following, where Messiah is going to sit on his throne. He'll rule with a rod of iron and we'll rule, rule with him. Um, but her child, Jesus, right, was caught up to God. That's harpazo, basically, right there, too. Caught up, it's the same word. So he's caught up. Does anyone doubt what the term caught up and harpazo means? When Jesus ascended during his ascension, that was a harpazo. That was a, like a rapture. Same word. But he was caught up to God and to his throne. Where is Christ's throne? Right hand of the Father. The right hand of the Father. Remember where that passage is? No, no we'll get to it. All right, we'll, we'll get to it. You can dig if you want, but now we're kind of, this is John, under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, giving us the background of, of um, the dragon and his aggression after, for after Christ, remember he tempted Christ, and then he's going after Israel, and he's always been going after Israel. So then we get up to, we're kind of up to current. So it's parenthetical, but then it brings us up current, where it says in verse 6, And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she has a place prepared by God, in which she has, or she is to be nourished for 1260 days. Three and a half years. <laughs> We also have in, in Matthew 1, now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. She was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Matthew 2, starting verse 7 says, Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. So this is Satan fighting back, right? And being warned in a dream to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. And when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother, flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt. So this is uh, echoes of what we see um, happening by the time we get up to do this part of the book. Sure. So, uh, chapter 1, verses 30 to 33, I think we, re we read this this morning. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there shall be no end. That should give us much peace, right? Are, are you all still with me? Have I lost anybody yet? We're clear on what's going on historically. This is, you see how John is bringing everything current, bringing us up to date? Okay, so now... We're going to get to where, we're going to catch up to where this uh, final woe um, is, and not the final, yes, the final woe, and also the, um, yeah, he's going to bring us current on this, this final war. That's what I meant to say, but that's both, the woe and the war. Okay, so verse 7, now war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back, 
but he was defeated and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent, who's called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to earth and his angels were thrown down with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and his authority of Christ have come. For the accuser, which is what devil means, okay? The accuser of our brothers has been thrown down who accuses them day and night before our God. And they have conquered him. How did they conquer him? By the blood of the lamb, by the word of their testimony, for they loved not their lives even unto death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath, because he knows that his time is short. So, where is the devil now, at the, as of this moment? Is, is the devil in hell? No. So he's not down there poking people who've died with a pitchfork <laughs> and stuff? No. So uh, that's roaming to and fro and uh, seeking yeah. whom he may devour. Exactly right. Now, uh, some more bad doctrine to handle. Um, did when Jesus died, um, did he have to go to hell and fight the devil and take the keys from him? No. <laughs> Where's that in the Bible? It's a fantasy. But I actually heard that at a Southern Baptist church here in town. Um, some years ago, but that's when what was going on. Jesus went down into hell and I don't know, Bob Satan knows where he had to do it, took the keys of hell and death from him. Really? Where's that at? <laughs> that's what Joyce Myers preaches. There's a lot, of, a lot of word of faith type stuff yeah. that goes in that direction. In fact, they'll go they one step them. further. Copeland, yeah, they'll go one step further and say he didn't, wasn't just go to hell, but he went there and he was tormented. Tormented. So Jesus, when he said it is finished, he lied. And it wasn't finished. He had to go down there and... Where, and where in Scripture does it ever say that Satan had the keys? To exactly. And I think we covered that before, right? When we talked about Abaddon and Polyon and get keys hand, handed to him. And then you had to turn him back in when he was done, I guess. So some bad theology out here. So it pays to go in and do some digging. So, um, you know about this, too. We kind of looked at it. Last week, I guess it was. Flip back to uh, Daniel chapter 12. Oops. Ezekiel and Daniel. Or Ezekiel. I guess you can't call him denial, can you? Okay. Belteshazzar. Belteshazzar. Um, Daniel 12, this speaks to this time. At that time, this in time here, you know, the whole chapter 11, sometime you need to go in there and dig. This is about the final intrigue going on in the earth, especially with the Antichrist. Um, I'm thinking a lot of it, much of it is before he's even possessed by Satan. But this is some political and war type maneuvering and intrigue going on particularly in the first half of the uh, tribulation. In a little bit, it'll leap ahead. It'll make comments that applies to beyond time and that. But chapter 12, um, as much as I'd like to sink my teeth into Daniel 11 tonight, we, we're not going to do that. Um, at that time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people, who's Daniel's people. The church? Israel. Israel, all right. The woman is still not the church here. And there shall be a time of trouble. This sounds a lot like what Jesus said in the Olivet Discourse, right? There shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. And at that time, your people shall be delivered. And we're going to see that before we finish up this chapter. Everyone who else delivered, everyone who is found written in the book. Interesting. 
wow, I wonder how some of the ones who weren't, whose names weren't written in the book, if they tried to tag along, what happened to them? Interesting, huh? And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. This, this is looking forward here now. Some to everlasting life, some do shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament. And those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run true and fall fro and knowledge shall increase. This is where we we kind of broke off last week. We were kind of looking at this verse five. Then I Daniel looked and there stood two others, uh, one on the riverbank and the other on that riverbank. And one said to the man clothed in linen, I don't know if the one talking to the angel in linen, probably Gabriel, if he's if he's seen John that that uh Daniel kind of time traveled here, or whatever, how the division works. I don't know how it works. John didn't know how it worked. He was, or Paul didn't. He said, I, he uh, says, I knew a man, and he says he spent a, some time in heaven, and whether it was a dream or whether he was there, he didn't know. That's basically what he's saying. Second Corinthians, right? So Paul didn't even know whether he was having a vision or if he was actually there or what was going on. So we can't really tell that from the text. But Somehow it looks like maybe Daniel is seeing John talking to Gabriel, that same event that we just looked at. So, and one said to the man clothed in linen, who was above the waters of the rivers, how long shall the, the fulfillment, how long shall the fulfillment of these wonders be? Then I heard the man clothed in linen, who was above the waters of the river, when he held out his right hand and when he held his uh, right hand and his left hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever that it shall be a time, times, and half a time. Three that, three. There we go. Oh. <laughs> and when the power of the holy people had been completely shattered, all these things shall be finished. So anyway, we're, this is all focusing on the same thing. So it talks about Michael and uh, him going to war with heaven. Michael shall stand up. So stand up is kind of like, don't make me pull the car over. <laughs> you know, so Michael stands up and says, don't make me get up. Don't make me come over there. So that's what this was. Michael shall stand up. So we have a lot about the accuser in, um, like I said, in Job, in Job 1, verse 6 to 11, and in chapter 2, 1 to 6, same kind of thing where he is before God and he's accusing Job. Um, Zechariah 3 Go ahead and flip there. You can flip there if you if you want to. Zechariah 3, verses 1 to 10. This is interesting. Um, then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to oppose him. And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and was standing before the angel. He answered and spoke to those who stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, See, I have removed your iniquity from you, and I will clothe you with rich robes. And I said, Let them put a clean turban on his head. And so they put a clean turban on his head, and they put the clothes on him, and the angel of the Lord stood by. Then the angel of the Lord admonished Joshua, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, If you will walk in my ways, and if you will keep my command, then you shall also judge my house, and likewise have charge of my courts. I will give you places to walk among those who stand here. Hear, O Joshua, the high priest, you and your companions who sit before you, for they are a wondrous sign. For behold, I am bringing forth my servant, the branch. Who's the branch? Jesus. Jesus, that's right. For behold, the stone that I have laid before Joshua. Upon the stone are seven eyes. Behold, I will engrave its inscription, says the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. In that day, says the Lord of hosts, everyone will invite his neighbor under the vine 
and under the fig tree. Is that not a blessing or what? That's your advocate, Jesus Christ, standing, even as the accuser is, seeks to uh, accuse you, standing in the gap as your advocate before God the Father. 1 Peter 5 8, we read, we get here, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. But may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Jesus Christ, after you suffered a little while, perfect, established, strengthen and settle you. To him be glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. I want you to see Hebrews chapter 2 about the advocate. Mm -hmm. Got to flip back a handful of pages. Starting with verse, uh, verse 10. For it was fitting for him, for whom all things and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare your name to my brethren in the midst of the assembly. I will sing praise to you. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, here am I and the children whom God has given me. Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For indeed he does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. Therefore in all things he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. And while I'm here, I'm just going to go through these real quick because they're beautiful, and I think we all need to know where we stand with Christ. And 12.2, uh, we'll start with verse 1. Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. And let us run with endurance the, rate, the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Hey, there it is. If you want to flip back a couple others, let's, let's take a quick look at Romans 8. Let's look at some verses there. Why is it so important to know where we stand in Christ, do you think? Because we don't know who we are in Christ, it affects our whole practicality. Say that again louder and more slowly. I said, if we don't know who we are in Christ, we don't, it don't affect our practicality. It don't, it don't affect everything, the way we live our lives, the way we pray, the way we treat people. We have to know who we are in Christ. That's important. Yeah. <laughs> Experience. <laughs> Romans 8, verse 33 says, Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us 
from the love of Christ. So tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword. As it is written, for your sakes we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen? Amen. All right. A couple other passages to just write down would be um, Ephesians. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14, and also Philippians 1, 6. So just to finish up here on, on the dragons, I don't know how far we're going to get tonight. We're going to get halfway through anyway. The dragon. Isaiah 14 just to look at a handful of verses, like verse uh, 11 to 13, about the dragon. Your pomp is brought down to Sheol, which is the grave, and the sound of your stringed instruments, the maggot is spread under you, and worms cover you. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations, for you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. We'll also look at uh, Ezekiel 28. Ezekiel 28 says, You were the signet of perfection, full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, the sardius, topaz, diamond, beryl, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald and gold. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. You were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. Verse 16. By the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence within, and you sinned. Therefore I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God, and I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of fiery stones. Your heart was lifted up. Because of your beauty, you corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I laid you before kings that they might gaze at you. You defiled your sanctuaries by the multitude of your iniquities, by your, the inquiry of your training. Therefore, I brought fire from your midst. It devoured you, and I turned you to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all who saw you. All who knew you among the peoples are astonished at you. You have become a horror and shall be no more forever. So a lot of that is bringing us up through all the way through the tribulation period, right? Where his judgment is and then he's going to be cast into the lake of fire. He and the Antichrist will be among the first residents. The Antichrist, actually the Antichrist and the false prophet will be the first residents of the lake of fire. Satan's going to be bound in chains waiting his turn out, right? So, so verse 13 in, in Revelation 12, And when the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. But the woman was given the two wings of the great eagles that she might fly from the serpent into the wilderness, the place where she has, where she's to be nourished for a time, times, and half a time, three and a half years. <laughs> now, the great eagle, eagle, two wings, I don't know if that is angelic airlift, what's going on some, somehow. I mean, God could send a big giant eagle with two wings, but we know very often the, the, um, that angels are 
are often described as being like eagles. So I don't know exactly what that looks like, but it could just be too that it's the Lord's way of saying, you know, the woman was given, we're still talking about the woman, not a lot of people. The woman was given the two wings of the great eagle. The Lord just cleared the path, helped her to fly to shelter. And then the serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth after the woman to sweep her away with a flood. Now, he could have used actual water. It's possible that he's using actual water or an actual flood to go after the woman. Very often talking about sending a flood after somebody in the Old Testament was it was like an army, just a swarm of people going after her. Now, the timing of all this, bringing some chapter 11 into this, we know that Satan came down. And Satan came out of the pit, and he goes after the two witnesses, right? And he slays them, and they lay in the street for three and a half days. Could be that we we know that the abomination of desolation, where he goes into the temple, desecrates the temple, stands in the temple, telling himself he's God, making himself God in the temple. He came, first thing he did was when he landed in Jerusalem by the temple, we were given temple for a reason, I think, in chapter 11, and I think that's where a lot of the activity was going on. That's where Satan was headed to, and I think that's probably where the two witnesses are, right? So the two witnesses are there. Are there. So now possessed Antichrist, Satan, is able to slay the two witnesses. Slays the two witnesses, immediately goes into the temple, desecrates the temple. Because we have 1,260 days, 1,260 days. It's got to be that kind of a, ti a timing. Now, the woman flying to a place, there's three and a half days here between when these guys, the two witnesses, resurrect, right? Rise up and go in and there's a big earthquake. What we're going to see that happens here really quick is another earthquake. And... The earthquake happens after the three and a half days. So I am guessing, and it's just a guess, that we see so much from, from Romans 11 and how all Israel will be saved. This is not talking about every last person of Israel, but the land will be saved according to God's promises. And there'll be a major revival in the very end. And we can explore this a little bit more. So they see the abomination of desolation, and this is not a Jewish thing to do, is to put an image in the temple. I don't know if during that three and a half year period, the false prophet's ready, and he's got this statue here, and he's ready to bring it into the temple, um, how that happens. But I'm guessing there's a lot of temple stuff and desecration and things going on and planning at, at the very least in that three and a half day window after the Antichrist um, possessed by Satan, has slain the two witnesses, okay? Because it's 1,260 days this way, and there's 1,260 days this way. So we get to 1,260 days, we got the slaying of the two witnesses, that's when their ministry time is up. Got a three and a half day period there where Satan could be in the, desecrating the temple, and that marks off the middle of the week. Hey, I'm God, everybody, so that's first day he shows up. Then the beast system and the statue and stuff probably follow, and who knows what else he's doing in the temple to desecrate it. So meantime, the Jews are going, you know, I read about this. It's time to get out of Dodge. And they're making a beeline for Petra, where they're going to be protected for a, a time and times and half a time, three and a half years, right? So divinely protected. Satan's angry. The Antichrist is angry. So he sends an army after them to go after them. And it's not unlike what we saw with the exodus, right? This is like another exodus. Pharaoh says, yeah, go ahead and go. Get out of town. Take our jewels. Take everything that you've got. Get out. Just get out of town. And after a while, he's so angry that he says, you know what? Just like what Satan's described here is in his fury. He's furious now because he's lost. He's angry. So he's saying, no, no, go after them. Get them. And just like Pharaoh sent chariots after Israel back in the exodus. So they're going after him. And God divinely protects them, opens up the ground to swallow the armies, just like he opened the waters and closed the waters on the on Pharaoh's armies, and then takes out the armies. Make sense? In regards to the eagle's wings? Yes. 
if you look at uh, Exodus 19.4, basically the same, same mm -hmm. exact wording. You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to my side. Yeah, so did God so literally God's, bring eagles' yeah, wings? It's, no, it's, it's God's flight, speed. Providential protection. Right. Yeah. Some people will take, I, I'm all for whenever possible taking scripture as literal as can be, except for it doesn't make sense to. You know, so here again, we, we look at context and we do exactly like you said, you go to the Exodus and you see how else that's used in the past in scripture. And you say, oh, okay, let's apply this here. So it's like, it's like the second coming, all the prophecies of the Old Testament and, and the nature of the way things were supposed to happen were, were literal. We had a literal first Exodus visit. 19, four. Exodus 19.4. Yeah. Uh, so the second coming, all the verses about the second coming are literal. So there's no reason to not take all those as literal as well, including all the things that we're reading here. Why would we have all these Old Testament prophecies telling us what's going to happen when the Messiah came the first time? And those are all literal but then when we get into this chapter here about the consummation of the ages, say, no, this is all figurative. It doesn't make sense. That's not the pattern that God has already established in the past, right? Well, even, even when we're looking at literal passages, there are sometimes figurative language mm -hmm. used. Like this, you know, we, all, we obviously know that God did not bear Israel out of Egypt on the wings of eagles. Right. And they ran and they crossed the Red Sea. And, mm -hmm. But he says, I bore you out of Egypt. Of eagles, so. Yeah, that's kind of my rough scenario because it's it, you got so much happening right at the start of the Great Tribulation, and it's this point here where um, the number of days that the two witnesses are supposed to be ministering, the number of days that we have with the abomination of desolation being right in the middle of the week, and how much time is left, and there are more verses that. Uh, that inform that. We're going to go ahead and, and um, we'll stop right here this time. We'll pick it up in the, with the rest of, of chapter 12 later because there's uh, still more to look at in here that I think is, is cool. And I don't want to feel rushed, but I also don't want to do what I did last time and, and, um, <laughs> and go on too long and have to, have to make this uh, two videos from one evening. I'd rather do uh, take the time to, to spend the right amount of time on it and, and care and concern and so forth. But take a look at that timeline that I um, just mentioned and see if that makes sense. And uh, meantime, do you have any questions or comments? Is this making any sense at all? Or I mean, Wings of Eagles has to do, you know, it's a divine intervention, God lifting them up and, and carrying them out, carrying them through. And it was a miraculous thing that God did. Uh, God performed a miracle on their behalf and got them through quickly, the best, shortest possible route. So I think we'll see the same thing here. What, what exactly that will be between Israel, particularly Jerusalem, and what that will look like on the way to Petra, I don't know. But it won't take long for Satan to look up and say, no, I'm not going to let those guys get away with it. And it's go ahead and send an army after them. So, but I think it's in that three and a half day window that happens. There, and they get off in protection. Now, why do I say that? Well, God has always protected His before He brings wrath down, and, and wrath is getting ready to hit in full force in the bold judgments. He's already announced the seventh trumpet, but we're just at this parenthetical here where He's setting everything up and telling us what's going on. And, and just as we had with um, the plagues in Egypt, but God had them set away, set apart in the land of Goshen. They were protected there. Uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, we look at that example there, where um, even if there were 10 people, only 10 people righteous, I will not destroy Sodom. And then all the way out of town, it's like, you guys got to go hit the road faster because I can't do this until you're out. So God protects before he brings wrath. He protects his own. And we also see that with, as in the days of Noah with the ark. Same thing here. God's going to get them safe um, into Petra. And we'll get into Petra next week and how, how many people 
the estimate can fit there and and what that's going to look like. There's some people, not all Israel gets out of Israel. Um, some people are left behind. And I think it's, we have Zechariah, we're going to, if you look at Zechariah 12, maybe 12, 12, 13, 14, you get into there and you get all kinds of end times events. But I think it's something like, well, I have to refresh myself on this. I'm doing this off the top of my head, which is a scary thing. From Jerusalem, I think half of Jerusalem are saved is the figure. And then one third out of Israel as a whole make it out. So there's quite a few people that are left behind who, who uh, are not rescued. So we'll take a look at that next time. Any other questions, comments? No, I just want to say thanks to Larry. I know this verse says part of the blessing of Revelation, there's a blessing on those who read it is because to understand Revelation, you have to understand the whole Bible. Yeah. So I've never made that connection with the Exodus, Exodus and fear of wings and eagles. So that's it's like this, he swallowed up Pharaoh, so it says he's going to send, he's going to open up and swallow, so it's the same. It's the same. Seeing those things, so that's a big thing. Even though you did it through Google, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> Google. Uh, there you go. <laughs> hey, hey. Well, I've seen people take it really literally, and I've also seen where it's the Hal Lindsey type of thing where, um, nope, God's going to use a bunch of... Um, the eagle, eagle is is America's national bird. So America's going to come in and do an airlift and take all the Jews to Petra. So, uh, you know, I mean, Hal was doing stuff and seeing things and reading things that other people had never really spent a lot of time looking at. So kudos to him at the time and taking some bold leaps. But no, we can dismiss a lot of that. There's literal... And he would take a lot of things literally, except where it, he didn't, <laughs> you know, and he got, so it's, it's kind of a mishmash, but uh, I understand he's a great guy and he's probably changed his mind on most of these things by now, but uh, that's, that's not the, the way to, uh, not the way, the best way to interpret scripture, right? We're finding out now. So best way is to go into older scriptures, what's gone on before and see how we're supposed to understand the scripture we're in. Okay, so let's close in prayer. God, thank you again for insights into your word. There's so much in here, and I, I just feel like we're just zooming through some of these passages. Um, help us to have clarity, though, Lord, even if we are kind of going through it quickly. We could get bogged down, and we could spend a month in, you know, a half a chapter, and, and we could really draw a lot of different scriptures into play. Um, but then sometimes if we get micro-focused, we can um, lose the big picture because we've been bogged down looking at the fine details of one spot for so long. We lose the big picture of what's going on in the book. But Lord, help us, give us, uh, encourage each and everyone here uh, to seek wisdom and searching out some of these details in private time um, on our own. Uh, and flesh out some of the little details and uh, help us to comprehend what it is you're trying to tell us about what's going on in the future. What a blessing, God. What a blessed time. Bittersweet again, like John eating, eating the book. Um, it's bittersweet for us as well. And Lord, we just look forward to We look forward to, if, if you didn't want us to go ahead and finish um, studying the book of Revelation, we're ready to go ahead and, and move into the part of Revelation where we meet our exit. That would be great, Lord, too. And Lord, but meantime, keep us all safe and, and carry us through and help us to keep our eyes focused on Christ through the rest of this week. In his name we pray and give you thanks. Amen.